started? Uh, actually, before we get started, <laughs> uh, Lakey had something she wanted to announce. I have a very quick special announcement, hot off the presses. I got this um, not quite an hour ago, but uh, Faulkner Ridge um, Outdoor Pool passed inspection today, and we will be officially opening on Monday, July 19th. Uh -huh. Okay. So I want to go ahead and announce it now. We will be posting this on social media and um, on website tomorrow. So Hot wanted to mm -hmm. quickly let you know that. Moving on, advisory committee. Thank you, Lakey. Thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm Janet Evans, chair of the CA Board of Directors. Please remember that this meeting of the Board of Directors is being live streamed. You can find tonight's agenda and background materials on the CA Board's webpage. Links to these documents can also be found in the description section of, your, of our YouTube live stream for those who are watching this meeting there. If you're virtual, please mute your microphones or phones unless you're speaking. Raise your hand to speak and I will record names in the order in which I see them. If you are virtual, please use the chat feature. As we move through the meeting, I will introduce each advisory committee as a separate item. Bef uh, we're not going to go there. If at any point you're having trouble hearing me or any other board member, please speak up and we will adjust. I will now call the roll. Andy? Present. Sherry? Present. Jenny? Present. Dick? Here. Lynn? Here. Tina? Yep. Jess? Here. Alan? Here. Renee? Here. Lakey here and Janet. Okay. Sorry, getting my. All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, tonight is a special board work session with our advisory committee uh, report outs. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any objections? Mm -mm. Excellent. And we had no residents signed up to speak tonight. So we will move right into the work session topics, the presentations from CA's advisory committees. Um, Lakey's going to give a quick intro. I wanted to quickly say thank you to everybody that's participating tonight and just set a quick framework that we are using a different format this year. So I know some advisory committee members have been long serving um, and I appreciate the flexibility. This was based both on board feedback and staff feedback, um, trying to make sure that we use this time uh, to the benefit of everybody involved. So we kept the annual report as is um, in terms of the type of reporting, but we asked for the presentations tonight, one, not just questions only, but to make a presentation, and two, to cover some very specific questions uh, about what are your most impactful accomplishments, what is your plan for this year, and then very specifically, what can the board do to serve you, and how can the board better benefit from the expertise uh, of your advisory committee. So. We are excited about the new approach and hopefully everyone will find it more engaging and beneficial this evening. Thank you. Okay, so first up we have the Advisory Committee for Aquatics. Eric? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. All right. Share my screen, sorry. Okay, so uh, Aquatics Committee, as you said, and uh, I think you can see the mission statement above. Um, is to provide input to the Columbia Association on policies and programs concerning the operation and suggested improvements of CA's indoor and outdoor aquatics facilities and activities. You can see a list, we have about 10 members. Um, Many of them are long standing, um, and uh, some of us new. We've got we've added a few people uh, within the last year to get some different uh, ideas flowing in our group. Uh, most impactful accomplishments. Um, 
we think that one of the things we did really well over the last year, especially with COVID happening, was to be in touch with the aquatics community that we, we all touch. Different of us uh, work within different groups within the aquatics community. So for instance, uh, my kids are a big part of the CNSL. Some of one of the other members' uh, family is big into the Clippers. We have some of the people from the aqua aerobics. Um, and throughout this whole time, we've been both giving the association the aquatic staffs ideas and thoughts to the public that we know, spreading the word that way, and then getting their feedback to the policies and procedures that were um, that were implemented so that they could continue to be implemented, hopefully to improve everybody's experience. And I think uh, that's one of the biggest things that uh, not just this year, but every year that our group does. Um, we uh, also helped work with uh, Marty and his whole entire staff um, to look at the all the pools, indoor and out, and all the different programming to try to consolidate that programming um, and make it more efficient use and the big thing I think that really looked at is we moved a lot of the Clipper stuff all to the aquatics indoor pool during the primary indoor pool season. And that allowed for better carpooling, people not having to be all over the community in regards to for the Clippers parents and for all the other groups, it allowed for some more times, I think mostly for uh, some lap and some open swim to be opened up so that there was a little more availability of pools to the community. Um, those are the two biggest things I think over the last year that we've really, really worked on and uh, had an impact for. Um, our biggest uh, things coming up. Uh, we wanna continue to recruit new mem members and potentially get bigger, so we represent a larger percentage of Columbia. Um, we'd like to become a little more diverse in both the socioeconomic and utilization backgrounds of the community as a whole, and specifically as those that are using our, our facilities, aquatic facilities. Uh, we were also trying to better understand the, or we'd like to better understand the community desires for aquatics as a whole. Um, pretty sure there are some areas that maybe people have ideas like, oh boy, wouldn't it be cool if we were doing this at our pools? And we wanna find a way to better get that information from the Columbia Association members so that we can bring that to the board and hopefully work to put programming in place that makes our residents happy. Uh, opportunities uh, for the CA board to better benefit from our advisory committee skills and expertise. I think when we're sitting down the, uh, we think we have a pretty, good group of people with a lot of different problem solving skills with a lot of different ideas. Um, but the biggest thing that we think would help us and the ways we could benefit is, is to get a little more um, concrete ideas and topics that the board itself wants us to look into or things that you see as needs that we should be addressing or looking into for the aquatics community and the community at large so that then we can decide how to go forward and maybe come up with a game plan for doing that. Um, we think that uh, opportunities like this to actively engage uh, the committee and uh, provide opportunities in shorter form, not long meetings, um, but that allow for more direct and deeper discussions with the board about aquatics and what the board wants would be very useful to us. Um, opportunities, uh, I think the thing then, and again, COVID's been kind of tough on everybody, but uh, to have the board liaison present at uh, the majority of our meetings and to participate actively and bring to us the board's perspective about the things that you've talked about in your meetings and what you want of us to our meetings so that we can then uh, actively pursue what your ideas and goals might be. And uh, again, providing clear indication 
where you'd like us to focus our time and efforts to support your decision-making process about aquatics related subjects. And I think, uh, thank you, that that answers all of the questions you were asking of us uh, in regards to this format. And I believe we were attempting to keep it short, so I'm sorry if I wasn't short enough. <laughs> no, that was perfect, Derek. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions for, oh, Lynn. Hi, yeah, uh, Eric. I've been a swimmer in Columbia for a long, long time. And one thing I've noticed, especially going back this year, I don't see, for instance, I go to, I, I go to the running brook pool usually. It's not very heavily used. Um, we probably had the biggest crowd last Sunday, according to the lifeguards, and it was like maybe half full. That was free Sunday too. I don't know if that can be. So I just, how, how would you see increasing the membership in, in the pools. I mean, how do we get more people to use them? Some pools I know are really packed. You know, the ones that have, you know, more things for kids. I know Dorsey Hall is usually very full, but a lot of the other pools around are not. So how do, how do we get them to be used the way we hope they should be used? Well, I think that, th that from my perspective, there's two questions in what you've asked. One is, how do we get more membership to use the pools, the people that are already members mm -hmm. and the pools that maybe aren't as heavily used? And then the second being, how do we gain more membership? Um, yep. I, I would say that uh, during COVID time, there's an opportunity to be had to, and again, that's up to you guys, to particularly advertise potentially out to the people outside our actual Columbia Association area and say, hey, you can buy a membership to the Columbia Association and then be able to use some of our facilities and those include our pools. Um, and so I think there's that opportunity in regards to getting people to go to particular pools, I have sh struggled with that over, I've only lived here seven years. Uh, I live literally right behind the Faulkner Ridge pool. Okay. That is not the only pool me and my family go to. We go to other pools because we wanna try out some of the other features. But I think uh, a lot of people tend to want to go to their community pool because it's easiest. And I don't know how we increase the number of people in a particular given community that want to use their particular pool. The, and I'm, I'm not sure. So that could be something certainly as we start to, f as we've asked as one of our things to reach out to the community to try to figure out what it is they're looking for. Um, that that may be some of it is trying to figure out in the targeted areas where we want to increase use of a pool, why people aren't using the pool in that community. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, Eric, and thank you to everyone who has served on the Aquatics Advisory Committee. I will pass that along, thanks very much. Okay, next up we have the Climate Change and Sustainability Advisory Committee and Tim Latimer will be speaking on behalf of them. Hi, Tim. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Awesome, great. Um, so first of all, uh, yes, I'm Tim Latimer and as a resident of the Long Reach Village, uh, I am especially delighted to see uh, you, Janet, as the uh, leader of the board and uh, sitting as chair. Um, and really it's an honor and a privilege to be with you all this evening. So um, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here, just have a very brief um, PowerPoint here. Let's see if that comes up. One moment here. Can you all see the screen? Yes, yes we can. Are you able to put, it? oh, there we go. That was my there next go. question. <laughs> Great, well, first of all, yes, uh, and I just wanna say uh, at the outset, uh, a huge thank you to Jeremy Scharfenberg, uh, CA's energy manager for his uh, great support of our committee. Um, and also to Ginny Thomas for her outstanding support as well as the board liaison to our committee. Um, and thank you to the board for creating this committee uh, back in 2018 and having the vision to do, to do that mm -hmm. and uh, for uh, your continuing support all along. And just a reminder, and especially for the newcomers, um, this committee was created in 2018 with a view to having this uh, committee serve to support CA 
in its efforts to promote environmental sustainability, and in particular for us to focus on ways to mitigate and adapt to uh, climate change and promote a more climate resilient community. And um, the image that you see there is, you might recall, there was a big storm that hit back in 2019 um, and it uh, did a lot of damage, uh, as I recall, in uh, areas around King's Contrivance and other uh, parts. This image that you see was actually taken in the area uh, around Town Center above the mall. This was back around, I think, May of 2019. Um, but it's not just major storms we're concerned about, it's also prolonged heat waves. And as we've seen in the Pacific Northwest, um, the heat waves can actually have a really devastating impact on not just ecology, but also on human beings. And the toll on human lives can actually be pretty extraordinary. Um, so it's, it's the silent killer. And it's something we should always be mindful of when we look at the risks posed by climate change. So um, just to highlight very quickly um, the things that we've been looking at over the past uh, year. Um, so we've been working in uh, several different areas. One is uh, to uh, initiate a climate vulnerability assessment and uh, we appreciate very much the opportunity to have worked with uh, members of the Watershed Advisory Committee in developing a scope of work for some uh, technical support uh, to be brought in. Uh, and that led to uh, an RFP that led to the hiring of Michael Baker International, which is now in the process of doing some technical analysis. And uh, in a part of that effort also that's really exciting to me is the development of a geographic information system or GIS tool that will help us in presenting and doing some data visualizations to help folks in the community better understand where some of the risks might be most pronounced uh, in Colombia. Um, and so they're in the midst of doing that work right now. We anticipate having um, the um, scenarios on climate and uh, some of that initial technical analysis um, as early as August that will then help us in arming us as we go out to uh, engage with the community. And we still want to focus initially uh, on community engagement with uh, the Wild Lake Village um, and do a process with them, learn from that, and then scale it up to take that to other parts of Colombia. But this GIS information tool is being developed for the entirety of Colombia and it will be a really important tool, we think, going forward. Um, also on regenerative landscaping, we've had a really exciting uh, program uh, this past year, the Yards Alive program, uh, to engage residents to help them find ways of having more environmentally sustainable um, vegetation in their yards, basically looking at ways to swap out um, native plants, uh, you know, and put those in instead of lawns. Uh, a lot of uh, residents uh, in this pilot program in Mills have uh, embraced it enthusiastically, and we're grateful to the support that we've had also from CA staff in launching the Yards Alive website, which is a part of uh, the CIA or CA websites. Uh, and uh, uh, we know not a lot of folks are already blogging on that site, talking about their experience with promoting um, regenerative landscaping. And we understand this is also now getting a lot of interest in other villages, uh, for example, in Wild Lake and King's Contrivance. So that's something we're going to be looking at, uh, looking to scale up in the coming year. Um, those are the two big highlights, I think, for the past year. We've also done some uh, work um, on uh, food waste. And part of uh, everything that we want to do uh, also is community engagement. And we've got folks who are uh, really engaged in the different parts of the community. And uh, we want to ramp that up in the coming year as well. Um, so um, that kind of goes then to the highlights uh, for what we hope to do in uh, the fiscal year 2022. Um, uh, we'd like to complete the GIS information tool and do further community engagement to build that out and uh, really help utilize that tool in a much more um, dynamic way with the, with the community. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do some of that with in-person meetings as the pandemic uh, uh, improves, fingers crossed, uh, in the coming months. Um, and likewise with regenerative landscaping, we're looking to expand the Yards Alive effort. Um, we've also had, um, I forgot to mention in the past year also, one of our members has been really involved in developing um, uh, research on pollinator gardens. We've got some uh, test uh, beds that have been planted in Kennedy Gardens um, and uh, in Owen Brown and uh, looking to uh, put one in um, in uh, Wild Lake, I think, in September. And I know that there's also some interest, if not not mistaken, as well in, uh, in the Long Reach area for um, pollinator gardens. 
And so that's an area that we're going to want to continue to also build out uh, over the coming year. Um, and likewise, um, we've developed a pilot uh, webinar on food waste. Uh, reducing food waste is hugely important for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, believe it or not. Um, and so that's an area that we're going to look to ramp up as well over the coming year. Um, so um, opportunities uh, for the way that we can interrelate with the board and how the board might benefit from our committee. Um, one thing I would just like to stress is our committee is unusual in that we were created not based on village representation necessarily, but uh, based on uh, the uh, backgrounds and professional expertise of members of our committee. The 13 members of our committee have a wide background um, in relevant um, experience. We have engineers, we have ecologists, we have educators, uh, former environmental planners. Um, and so we've got folks who have a, a lot of uh, depth of knowledge to bring to bear on this and a lot of interest and energy to do so. Um, so, you know, that's something that we, we hope the board will always feel free to be uh, willing to, to tap into. Um, we also have in our uh, constellation of members, people who are very active in other parts of the environmental community. So um, we have our fingers in a number of different pies and uh, lots of connections with uh, different organizations and our ear to the ground on what's happening. Um, and we think that that's something that can also uh, be helpful in informing uh, the board on uh, some of the things that are happening uh, in the environmental community. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd like to think that uh, board members uh, should feel free to reach out to us for informal advice, uh, whether it's on uh, substantive matters or on messaging as it relates to sustainability and climate and that kind of thing. So um, those are areas that our, our members are perfectly uh, happy and uh, enthusiastically supportive of uh, uh, helping to support. Um, how the board might be able to support our committee, one of the things we've thought about is um, uh, at times when we want to roll out and, and start doing uh, more community engagement, we might look to you all for help with Entree in terms of engaging with some of the key community leaders in your particular villages. Um, so uh, we really appreciate your, your help and I know in the past uh, many of you have already been helpful in that regard and we look forward to that continuing. Um, on things like the Yards Alive program, to the extent the, the, that CA has the capacity to do it, if the board is willing to authorize funding for things that can help to showcase the work that's going on with signage, um, and other uh, materials to, to help in getting the word out or in uh, helping to invest in uh, purchasing native plants and things that can be distributed uh, further into the community. Those are areas that we think uh, uh, board support would be very, very helpful. And then finally, on uh, advocacy, there may be times where um, it might be helpful for the board to, to weigh in on behalf of CA on uh, emerging environmental or climate issues at both the local level in the county um, or at the state and federal level. So um, with that, uh, I just want to say thank you again for your support. Um, here are the names of our uh, current uh, committee members. Um, and uh, I would just add that in addition to the sort of the professional background that our members have, um, our, our members have um, experience working at the level of the federal government, uh, both internationally and um, national in scope, uh, folks who work for the state on environmental matters. Um, and folks who work uh, in a much more local context. So we've got a, a pretty broad perspective uh, represented uh, among our committee members, and um, we appreciate the opportunity to bring that to bear here to help our community, which we love uh, in Colombia. So thank you for your support and um, your interest. Uh, Tim, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, Alan first, then Ginny, then Tina. Great, thanks. Um, is there anything that you all have run into? Sorry about that. The dogs have decided that has to come. Uh, anything that you all have run into by way of board policies that in your meetings you? I just wish wish those guys would just change that. Wish they, that's just that's just getting in our way. Um, you know I. I'm, I'm scratching my head. I can't think of anything off the top of my head where we felt like there was some policy thing that was really constraining us. You know, if anything, we've been very appreciative for the board's support. I mean, we would not have been in a position, for example, for CA to bring on the technical um, uh, analytical support 
with Michael Baker International to help us in doing this climate vulnerability assessment, were it not for this board's willingness to support that and help make that happen. Um, so, um, you know, I also feel like we have a very fluid and, and great two-way communication with our board liaison. Uh, Jenny is at almost all of our meetings and is active and, you know, we consider her a member of the committee. And so it really helps us in uh, understanding the dynamics with the, with the board and CA writ large. So, Good like I said, I can't do anything off my hand, but uh, I, I appreciate the question. And if we do run into anything, um, happy to reach back out and see if there might be some ways we could clear any bureaucratic underbrush or policy uh, obstacles that might we might run into in the future. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Ginny? Uh, yeah, Tim, uh, I just want to congratulate you and the committee in terms of, despite the pandemic, you met monthly. Uh, almost every month, which is fantastic. And the second thing is, just for the, the uh, board, uh, the blog that just went up uh, about a week ago, thanks to CA staff and thanks to the committee, uh, the Yard, Yards Alive committee, and um, has now 75 uh, members, which is just starting. It's fantastic. Uh, the third thing I want to really congratulate your committee on is uh, we talk about diversity, but you did it. Um, your committee wasn't as diverse as it, uh, you, it really should have been, and because you have that ability to help recruit, and of course people were, are approved by the board, but you weren't dependent on someone else telling you who should be on there, you actually did a very good job of, of uh, making sure that the committee is diverse. So thanks, thank you. You and the thank entire you, committee. I appreciate that. I mean, we've, we've got much more to do, obviously, um, but, um, you know, we, we, we start with the first step and we'll continue to do that. And certainly one of the things that we are mindful of is the need to look at climate and sustainability issues through the lens of environmental and climate justice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of area that we also want to just kind of make sure that we're helping to promote more broadly, not just in Columbia, but throughout the community. Tina? Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about a question specifically about Yards Alive. Is it specifically focused on single family homes or are you also looking at liaison with um, multifamily properties? Uh, I don't believe we're, we're limiting it only to single family. Um, I mean, I think where there are folks who are interested in making it happen, um, we're happy to try to help them make it happen. Um, mm -hmm. Part of the idea is to sort of look at ways to to um, to cultivate and you know promote uh, pollinator gardens and that sort of thing that uh, will be much more environmentally friendly. So um, I think if if there's a multifamily complex or unit that's interested, I, I think our folks would be delighted to find ways of working to help support that. But they would have to they would have to be the genesis of that interest, similar to a homeowner. Is that the process? Um, well, I, I, I think it's kind of two-way. We try to promote okay. this program through things like the blog to elicit interest. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, and, and, you know, Ginny, I know, has been more involved on the uh, pilot program in, uh, in Oakland Mills, but uh, I, I think a lot of it's also word of mouth. Um, but there are, we also have, I think, a Google map now where people can look and sort of see where there might be some of these properties. Um, and uh, I know that the group's also been looking at organizing like walking tours and those sorts of things to help publicize this effort. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, we just want to get to a critical mass where there may be more and more people interested and then see it really take off. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And thank you to everyone that's on the Climate Change and Sustainability Committee with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay, next up we have the Golf and Green Advisory Committee. Oh, what about Art Columbia Center. Art? Art Center? Art Center. Oh, I'm very <laughs> sorry, Liz, I know. See, that's why I need to put my glasses on because I'm pretending I can read it, but I actually can't. <laughs> so Columbia Art Center, Liz, you're up. Sorry about that. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Super. Thanks. Um, well, I'm glad to see Janet sitting at the head of that table. She's our liaison, and I appreciate that very much. Um, I'm going to just be reading, actually, um, our report. 
Um, so I'm going to go with uh, the format, the way it was presented. Um, our two most powerful, most impactful accomplishments for Columbia in the last year. So although the Arts Center's advisory committee did not meet as a group during the pandemic, several members assisted Center Director Liz Henze with installation and promotion of two signature events in March and April. The annual Visionary Women themed exhibit held March 8th to the 27th, concurrently celebrated National Women's History Month and International Women's Day. 19 local female artists participated with inspiring art representing an array of media. The show was viewed in person with timed entry observing COVID-19 guidelines, as well as online virtual tours. Number two, the annual Blossoms of Hope themed Invitational Gallery show was held April 15th to May 1st and, a raise, and raised awareness for the Claudia Mayer Tina Broccolino Cancer Resource Center of Howard County General Hospital. Two dimensional art was exhibited by 32 artists and gained viewers. And again, viewers had the same two options available to view the show in person or via online virtual tour. For both shows, artists were featured on CA's website and social media posts. Both shows were well received and attended, especially virtually. Um, our second, um, the second impactful accomplishment, uh, the advisory committee members helped promote the Art Center's reopening last October. Spreading the word about sampling workshop and reserved ceramic studio use. In restructuring the format of classes, we found that the sampling workshops were quite a hit in the community. We were able to pick up new students, particularly in the 25 to 40 age range. Some of the popular offerings were hand building with clay, fused glass, and acrylic flow. And thanks to its wonderful part-time ceramics team, the studio ran successfully while adhering to strict CDC practices for social distancing. The Arts Center implemented an effective strategy of selling series passes through Group X on Spectrum, allowing students to use passes for reserve time to create wheel thrown or hand-built pottery or to glaze their work without any of the rooms becoming overcrowded. I would just like to add one item from September 2019. Um, our members assisted the Art Center with Color Columbia, its plein air painting event held downtown at Lake Kitt and Wild Lake where artists take advantage of our beautiful natural environments and iconic architecture to produce landscape paintings. Works were displayed at the center's galleries and awards were presented by the DAC, uh, Howard County Promotion and Tourism, and several Columbia art advocate, advocates. Members of the advisory committee help with set up, manning of welcome booths at both lakes and promotion of the event. So what are our two, this is number two, what are our two biggest priorities for the advisory committee for this current year? So the first one is as health guidelines provide to continue to return the Arts Center to full programming. That's the biggest one. And number two, to support Columbia Arts Center's efforts to reach the community through enhanced promotional and marketing strategies, celebrating the diverse cultures and meeting the needs of changing demographics throughout our region. Number three, uh, identify opportunities for the CA board to better benefit from our committee. So we feel it would be beneficial if CA board members got to really know us. Attending a meet and greet at the Art Center during one of its quarterly meetings, possibly participating in a sampling workshop and creating an art project would provide the board with an opportunity to, for, to observe firsthand the diverse artistic and visionary skill set of our advisory committee's members. CA board members, members might better understand the impact the community of our center brings to those living in Columbia and beyond through this interaction. Opportunities for the CA board to better serve the committee. So for number one is to provide funding support to keep our programs going and our equipment functioning properly. Consider creative options for fundraising by the center for new equipment and or supplies needed and sponsoring outside artist workshops. We're the only full spectrum art center in the area. Why shouldn't this facility offer the community an art workplace that comes close to the quality of the fitness facilities we enjoy. 
Number two, uh, attend an upcoming event where you can pair up with a advisory committee member who could provide a real look at the details that go into the art center's events and classes and how the advisory committee assists the staff to that end. So I have some brief closing remarks and they won't take very long. Um, I've been a student at Columbia Art Center since 2007. I was fulfilling a bucket list desire to throw pottery on a wheel. I now have a home studio. I sell my work, but continue to use the center to fire, glaze, and commune with others. The center is a very special home for me and many other artists, whether professional or budding, and has provided a lifeline during the pandemic. To be cut off from this community during the pandemic was traumatic for me and many others, but I would like to give credit to Liz Henze, a remarkable, ever positive force for the center, along with three devoted surrounding instructors, Nancy McIntosh, Jan Tumbarello, and Edna Davin, who took on a long overdue reorganization of that department and realized a vision of reopening the center safely to us. This type of vision not only provided a better functioning ceramic studio, but a much needed revenue stream the pandemic obliterated. In addition, during this time of isolation, the center was able to provide workshops and classes in fused and stained glass, flow acrylic painting, advanced watercolor and programs for homeschoolers. Special kudos to CA's marketing department for their support of the art center, keeping it visible during the pandemic with online features, weekly social media posts and inclusion in CA videos. Artists participating in both theme shows with this online presence CA gave them. I'd just like to leave you with a few quotes, if I may, from the center, uh, from, from users of the center. From Denise Tester, who's a ceramic, she calls herself a student, but I guarantee you she is an incredible uh, ceramic artist. She said the opportunity for any return to normalcy was a wonderful respite. For me, the Art Center provides not only a safe place to practice and stretch my artistic abilities, but also camaraderie. I couldn't be more thankful. From Chelsea Bork, who's a homeschool instructor, she said having the Art Center reopen got kids out of the house and off the screens to imagine, create, explore, learn, and laugh. The space gives parents an opportunity to allow their children to get messy and explore art. From Sue Nicholson, many of you may know, she is a, a long, a long, um, long-lived uh, Columbia resident and ceramics artist in our area. She said, "I've been taking ceramics classes for far longer than anyone wants to know. In addition to learning and hopefully improving my throwing skills, I've met and made great friends. This is the one time during the week that is only for me, and when I don't allow anything else to interfere, and for some reason that I can't explain." It is still a Columbia Association location that many people have not discovered and don't know anything about. And one last comment is from Jan Tamborello, who is an instructor there, and she says it all. It has been transformative to be present at the Art Center during the weeks and months since its reopening in October 2020. Each week I see more and more people of every age group and background returning to their happy place in search of creative outlets and sense of community that the Art Center provides. It has been like coming home. I invite all of you to come visit the Center and take a look for yourself at the advocacy efforts of the Advisory Committee and the efforts of the staff to provide a creative oasis for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, and I appreciate the uh, personal commentary as well. <clears throat> I was just checking out the uh, sampling workshops today, as a matter of fact. Oh, Hopefully. nice. <laughs> I'll be able to sign up for one. Does anybody have any questions for Lynn? No. All right, Very well, nice thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Lynn, and thank you to Liz as well and to everyone else on the committee um, and for your you know determination to keep it a robust community um, despite COVID, so thank you. All right, now I will put glasses on. <laughs> All right, so now we have the Golf and Green Committee, uh, Marco De Palma. Yes, good evening all. Uh, can you hear and see me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, again, my name is Marco De Palma. I'm uh, representing the Golf Advisory Committee and, and uh, Bill Harris, our chair, is not able to make it today, so I'm uh, 
standing in his stead. And I'm just going to, if you don't mind, uh, I have the slides here in front of me, but I'm just going to use them as my cheat sheet and I'm happy to submit them for the record. I think you already have a copy of a version of these. Um, and then open up for questions at the end. So I'll just dive in. Um, well, to start, let me just start with uh, an overview of our committee goal. Our goal of the Columbia Association Golf Advisory Committee is to involve the greatest number of members, residents, guests, and other stakeholders of the Columbia community and beyond in the facilities and programs. It also is to provide input and feedback to the CA on policies and programs concerning the operation and suggested improvements to the CA's golf facilities and programs and services. Um, so I think this, uh, these, these talking points are, are right in vain with, with that. Uh, first of all, with respect to the two most impactful accomplishments for the CA this, uh, this last year, and just like everyone else, uh, we had the COVID, the COVID overlay and, uh, and a surge in golf that we had to deal with. Uh, and so I think uh, uh, it, was, it was a pretty significant accomplishment and in no small part to all the CA staff uh, to, to pull this off and allow the surge to happen despite uh, the COVID overlay and just have the facilities serving so many more members, a lot of which are new members trying the game of golf since it was one of the few things that people could keep doing. Um, at the same time, I think uh, I, I personally can represent the idea, the fact that uh, the playability and the overall experience at both Fairway Hills and Hobbits Glen have improved significantly. Um, and I think that makes it much more attractive uh, for members and, and uh, help, you know, again, an accomplishment that I think we can, we can all be proud of. Uh, Fairway attracting many different kinds of golfers and uh, more public access and hobbits with uh, kind of a championship course and, and the ability to host uh, significant events. And I think we're getting closer and closer to doing that again. Okay, well, uh, what are the two biggest priorities for the advisory committee? I'm gonna start uh, with a little detour here. As you all know, Rodney Green, our new GM, joined us recently. And uh, I think that one of our big priorities as the advisory committee is to allow him to integrate into uh, the operations and help drive some of his vision and his expertise that he brings to the, to the CA and to the, uh, the golfing community in Columbia. Uh, so we're excited to work with him and help him kind of uh, drive some of his his dreams for where we want to go. Uh, so I think that's an important priority for us as a committee to to make sure that we're 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 well uh, connected there. Um, and then to continue attracting and retaining membership, uh, I think by focusing, continuing to focus on outreach and inclusion of diverse communities. Uh, to continue to focus on the playability and the attractiveness of the course, the courses, um, including all the kind of periphery areas, game practice areas, tees, walkways, bunkers, etc. Uh, golfers are are strange beasts, and uh, they have strange needs and wants, and we have to we have to keep uh, keep that in mind in everything we do uh, with respect to that. Um, and increasing kind of more inter-club opportunities between Fairway and Hobbits uh, uh, and kind of having that, uh, that meld better. Identifying the opportunities for the CA board to better benefit from the advisory committee skills and expertise. Well, I think um, we, as the advisory committee, we have many subcommittees and uh, many uh, different areas that we have to explore. A lot of them deal with issues that relate to the general public, paths, food and beverage, membership, uh, and, and, and with golf seeing this influx of players and members and some of the challenges of meeting these golfers' needs uh, along with the community needs, I think just keeping an, an open ear to, to that um, uh, and kind of adapting to help maintain the membership and grow the membership, I think uh, is important. Um, and, and this theme kind of continues in the next bullet in that we should continue to interface with the committee on, on an ongoing basis to better understand how to keep the influx of this, of the brand new golfers engaged in golf and the new, more diverse community that we want to bring in and how and what kind of programs we can put in place to, uh, to, to keep them engaged. Identify any opportunities for the CA board to better serve uh, our, our advisory committee. 
Um, I'm I'm echoing uh, what Eric said relative to uh, you know to whatever extent, and obviously we have some representation from CA, but uh, a board liaison to participate and share board's perspectives and updates and priorities and concerns and challenges uh, and share any kind of relevant information discussed uh, at the board level. Um, I think that would be very helpful kind of to make it a, a two-way communication uh, and to continue to provide updates and clarity on, on kind of strategic planning along with kind of more fiscal and operational transparency uh, so we can better understand kind of the bigger picture and the context of, of some of kind of the decision-making processes that uh, that we all collectively have to deal with. So um, I think that covers the basis that you asked for some information on. I'm happy to answer any questions. And if Rodney, you want, want to say anything just to kind of add on to anything I've said, uh, maybe now's a good opportunity. No, I think I think we're good, Marco. I mean, you know, one of the one of the advantages I think that that I have is that you know a lot of the, the committee members uh, play golf, and so you know, for me, as I'm 60 days in the role, is to uh, be visible. And you and I talk all the time. I mean, you know, we, we talk about things that that occur in the operation, you know, every day, and so you know, that's kind of my goal is to uh, you know make sure I'm there and visible to to you know handle any concerns that you know members uh, you know may have. So so far so good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have one question from Alan. Yeah, thanks, actually, too. Um, does the golf community have, I don't know, I should know, but I don't know what the current status is, but does it, do you, is it your opinion that the golf community has any position on whether golf courses should pay for themselves in terms of membership and, and other fees, or do you do, do believe that it's enough of a community good that it should be subsidized by the annual charge that every resident pays? Boy. Um, I'm not sure I have had enough time to think about this question. I mean, I mean, obviously, I think any operation needs to have kind of uh, uh, some some balance sheet and income statement that makes sense in the bigger picture. Um, so uh, at, at one level, it's got to make business sense, but at another, uh, like as you're alluding, I think the the uh, uh, the community as a whole and the CA revenue streams as a whole and how it affects the community in general uh, are a factor. It's probably maybe the way I should have said it is probably beyond my pay grade. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, I I guess then let me just make a statement of that, and this is just me talking, not the whole board, is that. It's a, it's a question that we, we have grappled with and need to continue to grapple with and more intensely, particularly given the hit to the budget through the COVID situation. And it's a, uh, you know, you, you are a board advisory committee. We'd love to, I, I would love, I won't say we, because I haven't talked to other board members. I would love to have your committee's best advice on that in terms of how your sense of how the golf community feels that when, when you have a chance to, to gather that information. Yeah, and yeah, no, that'd be great. I kind of, that, that dovetails into what I was saying, which is, you know, to whatever extent the board is willing to share more more details on the on the financials and then how it all flows, that, that would help us kind of have that better context for, for where we stand there. Great. The other question, and I apologize if you already talked about this, but I, I missed a little bit of the early part of your presentation. Um, has your committee talked about what you'd like to see done with Fairway Hills? In what respects? Well, we, we've been talking on and off about what should be done. Should it stay as a, as is? Should it uh, turn into a nine hole course? Should it turn yeah. into some other kind of uh, recreational opportunity for more different kinds of, of field-based <laughs> recreation? Have you all discussed yeah. that? No, actually, and that's, again, I think that's a perfect example of what, what we're saying. I think these kind of strategic ideas, I have not, I, I think I've been to most of the committee meetings, and uh, this has not come up as kind of an agenda item for our opinion on this. Uh, obviously, I've heard these conversations are happening, and Bill Harris, our chair, might be more involved in these conversations because he, he's, uh, he's more frequent at Fairway and more intimate with that. But it hasn't come up formally in our committee meetings. And um, 
so yeah, I, I don't have anything to offer there in terms of uh, ideas. It, it, it would definitely be something that I think we should talk about and you should get our, our, our sense on. I would, I would agree with that, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ginny and then Tina. Yeah, uh, you were talking about um, you want to do more in terms of diversity and I wasn't clear what exactly you mean by that. Um, and I want to relate it to Alan's question. If you were talking about economic diversity, meaning um, you would try and get more people that are lower income, perhaps children involved in golf, then really they're not going to be able to pay for themselves. Uh, there's going to have to be a subsidy there, I would assume. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure, what do you mean by diversity? Uh, I mean, that that, and also, uh, you know, programs for young kids to learn. The game is a very hard game to learn, and it starts at the beginning. The, the first tee integration that we have at Fairway Hills, I think, is fantastic for the CA, and that really helps uh, in that respect uh, with respect to the, the young ones, but kind of doing more of that uh, with respect to development of people who then can become members, the, the more economically uh, challenge folks, yes, there there is kind of the, that question uh, in terms of how we can integrate them better into into the into playing golf um, at these courses. Uh, you know, there are different programs uh, for women and other groups that I think, uh, with Joan uh, helping us there, will 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 help develop that those uh, components of of, uh, of the community. So I think. There are multiple aspects to that. I think the one you're bringing up is is a challenge in terms of how to how to make the economics work there again. Um, but that probably applies to many of the CA programs. And Marco, if I could just just jump in, you know, the yeah. first C program that we have uh, at Fairway Hills right now is 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 one of the actual largest chapters in the state. Mm -hmm. And so there's over 500 kids that that utilize that program at. Uh, at Fairway Hills, and yeah. um, and most, and, and I don't want to say if not all, you know, it is it is geared toward underprivileged, and then First Tee program as a whole throughout the country has always been geared toward you know underprivileged, and so um, you know again it's one of the most successful chapters in the state, and I, I moved here from Orlando, Florida, and uh, and one of the bigger chapters is in Tampa, and so I'm very familiar with the First Tee program, and uh, and and moving here. And seeing the program at Fairway Hills is, uh, is very impressive. So, you know, I yeah. can speak definitely to that program. Thank you. This might go, this might go back to, uh, I think the gentleman's name was Alice, right? Uh, his question of kind of how to make the, how the financial work and how that integrates into the community goals. Um, mm -hmm. And that would be a factor. Thank you. Tina, you had a question? Yep, thank you. I know that golf courses are heavy users of environmental resources, and I'm wondering what the appetite is for exploring opportunities for synergy with the Climate Change Committee. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, obviously, there's uh, there's always a sensitivity to that question, and I think we can bring this up at the next meeting. Uh, our superintendent, uh, Patrick, uh, should definitely get involved here. Obviously, they, they are trying to uh, be sensitive to the environment uh, and and develop and maintain these courses. So I think that's a great idea. I'll, I'll bring it up and uh, maybe we can find a way to share some uh, some resources and, and people at the meeting and maybe an agenda line item. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, and thank you to everyone on the Golf and Green Committee. Thank you, everyone. All right, next up we have health and fitness. Jessica? Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm just coming in camp, and for your background awareness, I'm a Columbia lifer. I grew up here. I went to college in a state, moved abroad, lived in other states, and part of what brought me back to CA was the fitness facilities. When I moved back to the area, I chose this area for the fitness areas. Um, it's such a it's such a huge benefit, and I, it's, it's been a huge benefit in my life. And one of the things that I probably I love the gym. When I go to the gym, I'm an avid gym goer. I didn't realize exactly how much. The facilities really enhance the overall quality of my life until the, until the pandemic closed them. I didn't realize how deep those friendships were in my life with people that I otherwise would never have met um, from random classes until I couldn't see them anymore. So I'm very happy that the facilities have been able to reopen. Um, and it's a huge thank you to the CA staff, the Herculean effort of keeping us all safe. Um, as we kept learning whole new things about a brand new virus. I'm terribly sorry to interrupt. I, I'm struggling to hear you. I would be so grateful if you can move closer to your microphone, if that's a possibility. I apologize. 
Yeah, sorry. Oh, better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, out of our accomplishments for the past year, there was a public health emergency, and the this club still operated in a manner consistent with the federal, CDC, state of Maryland, and Howard County government guidelines. During that time, the committee was able to share feedback on adjusted schedules, reservation systems, enhanced cleaning measures, and food ventilation, and virtual offerings to members. We also disseminated the efforts made to keep the fitness club users safe and the virtual options available to the CA fitness community. We discovered a whole new love in the CA population for virtual workouts and virtual coaching that we didn't know was there until we had to try it. Um, and it's been a, a real boon to people like parents who have to be at home um, for kids space reopen, that sort of thing, to get them involved and keep them active with the facilities. Our two big priorities are helping community members reintegrate into the fitness facilities and the fitness recreation programming post-pandemic. A lot of change, um, but trying to get people back in their routines and back to feeling welcome and seeing their friends at the gyms. We also want to continue to recruit new members, which is the makeup of the committee that represents the diversity of community in Columbia and our gym user groups. Um, we, I see diversity at the gyms. I've spoke, I've had conversations in French and Spanish with other gym guests. Um, but getting those people onto the board has been a little bit challenging, especially parents. Uh, obviously, if they need to use the kids' space, if it's gym, then they probably need childcare to attend a board meeting. So we're still working on that goal. The board can better benefit from our community's skills and expertise um, by getting a better understanding of the diverse fitness, health, and lifestyle amenities and programs offered within the fitness facilities. It's so much more than just like a gym, and that's what brought me back. Right, it's more than just a, it's more than just a weight room, more than just cardio room. The programming, all the offerings, and things to try was was the differentiator for me in picking my place to live. We can also help share fitness user requests for new equipment and program offerings, keeping up with the latest fitness offerings, routines, and increases the CA membership. By maintaining a competitive edge, CA clubs can continue to thrive. This information would certainly benefit the board's decision making on budget priorities. In return. Um, the board can better serve us by providing greater direction to the half act committee on specific ways the committee can advise or support the CA board and the Mission Vision Diplomacy Association. Um, as with the golf folks, if there's something that you're considering, we'd love to hear about it so that we can take that to the public and ask about it, talk to our friends, check in with um, gym goers so we understand what the board is trying to solve or trying to learn or trying to do. State board members can also serve us by regularly visiting and experiencing each of the fitness centers in the Columbia uh, community. There are competing programs for limited budget monies at CA. We understand that this is going to be challenging, but seeing you guys out of fitness clubs and you seeing other people out of the fitness clubs should be an important factor in making budget related decisions. Um, there's so much community there and we hope that you will be a strong part of it and then we'll, I'll see you at my classes. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Tina, lady, give your hand up. Oh, no, okay. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> Tina. Thank you, and I apologize again for interrupting. Um, I wanted to ask, you said something about um, the virtual fitness opportunities that you were, are you recommending continuing those in, in into the, please God, let it come soon, post-COVID world? <laughs> Tomorrow's going to be a Tomorrow's going to be guys. Mm -hmm. All done with COVID. <laughs> Um, you think about all the ways that people currently pay for online coaching, people paying for Beach Body and all kinds of those programs that are solely virtual. There's no way to go do that in person or like meet the trainer and then work virtually. Um, and so I think CA has a place in that market. And as long as there's still um, community member desire, and yeah, especially with parents, right? That that's always my my friends do Beach Body. It's always the thing is like I didn't have to leave the house, did to pack the kids up. The kid was asleep. I worked out. They woke up, and I did my with my day. So I think that still serves a place in the fitness options. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you for serving on the committee, and thank you to everyone else as well. All right. Next up, we have the International and Multicultural Advisory Committee. Laura? Hi, good evening. My name is Laura Smith. I'm the chair of the IMAC, CA's International and Multicultural Advisory Committee. And I'm sorry that I wasn't aware I could have slides, so it'll just be me talking. Uh, I'm a resident of Owen Brown, and as most of you on the board know, from 2009 to 2020, mm -hmm. I was the program manager at CA for international exchange and multicultural programs. Last year, I was furloughed and then laid off in September. 
Now I'm happily retired and I was volunteered to become the chair of IMAC when our former chair, Marcy Gitt, wanted to step down. So last month I was voted in as chair for the next year by IMAC members and the chairs of the five sister city committees. It was felt that my institutional memory would be valuable in assisting the uh, Grace Chang, who was rehired um, to run CA's International Exchange and Multicultural Programs. Uh, I think most of you are aware that the International Exchange component refers to Columbia's five sister cities, and the multicultural programs refer, refers to sort of more like local events. Um, we're members of Sister Cities International, whose mission is to promote peace through mutual respect, understanding, and cooperation, one individual, one community at a time. So to answer the, the first question about our most impactful accomplishments, um, and I'm gonna say over the last two years, um, our committee has 30 members. It includes the chairs and vice chairs of the five sister city committees who report to IMAC. So from March 2020 to April 2021, we met three times via Zoom, and three of the sister city committees also met virtually several times, and um, we attended a variety of sister city international Zoom conferences and presentations. As you can imagine, our relationship with Columbia's five sister cities overseas were limited to communications by email and WhatsApp and FaceTime with program directors. And we were unable to hold any multicultural programs between May 2020 and April 2021. It's worth noting that our Chinese sister city, Liang, donated three separate shipments of surgical masks to Columbia Association in March and April of 2020, which were distributed via the county's emergency management department, as well as to the Howard County Food Bank, Columbia Community Care, and CA Open Space. Jun Han, our liaison with Liang, received the award of appreciation from the state of Maryland for her efforts and contributions donating N95 masks from China to hospitals and clinics in the DMV, supporting frontline workers, first responders, and medical professions, professionals in their fight against COVID-19. Our most impactful accomplishments going back to FY2020 were that we did four sister cities cooking classes, Haitian, French, Ghanaian, and Chinese. They were held at the River Hill Village Center and the Elkridge Furnace Inn. Um, they were organized by our sister city committees uh, with the administrative support of CA staff and were a lot of fun. We held several events in 2019 relating to Black Lives Matter. We held the International Day of Drumming and Healing, which was organized with leaders in the African-American community and the Columbia Archives, held at the Miller Branch and it commemorated 400 years since the first enslaved Africans arrived in Virginia. A few days later, we participated in Juneteenth at Town Center and happily that is now going to be a national holiday. And the Tema Committee showed the film Black and Black at Howard Community College, followed by a discussion with students and faculty on the relationships between African-Americans and Africans from the continent and the Caribbean, which was a topic that had been suggested by participants at the Miller Library 400 years commemoration event. We also supported the summer 2019 Sister Cities student exchanges with three of our sister cities, Sergi Pontoise, France, Tres Cantos, Spain, and Liang, China. The French Sister City Committee had also made wonderful plans for a fall 2020 adult exchange here. And we also supported the recruitment of 20 candidates for the 2020 European exchanges that we do every summer. But they were, of course, canceled due to COVID and probably won't be able to happen until uh, July of 2022. So our two biggest priorities for this current year are one, since we've been absent, uh, to reestablish our presence in the community by reaching out to organizations such as the school system, Luminous, which is the name, the new name for Fern, uh, the Howard County Library System, the East Columbia 50 Plus Center, where we've always held our, our World Languages Cafe, to uh, and we hope to initiate virtual e-pen pal programs for students in French, Spanish, and Chinese classes um, with schools in our sister cities, as we know that in-person travel will not be possible. We're also planning to recruit new volunteers for our committee and each of the five sister city committees. Our goal is truly to reflect Columbia's diversity and to become a more inclusive advisory committee so we can really represent the range of national origins, ethnicities, races, cultures, languages, and customs. 
that are present here in Colombia. We plan to collaborate with CA departments and community organizations to bring diverse international multicultural performances to community events being planned already this fall in Colombia. For example, the mall in Colombia's 50th birthday, the Long Reach 50th birthday festival, and hopefully the multicultural festival of the Orthodox Church of St. Matthew's in King's Contrivance. IMAC members would really like to support local events as they pop up related to Black Lives Matter and anti-Asian hate. And we hope, we hope to support the Juneteenth celebration at Town Center next year. We also plan to explore some more fundraising opportunities for our committee and the sister city committees, given the need for funds for activities and the difficult, the difficulty we have in fundraising because CA is a 501c4. IMAC members are interested in the possibility of creating a Columbia Sister Cities Inc. 501c3 nonprofit organization, which would make it possible to fundraise. And it is the structure for the majority of US sister city organizations, but we recognize that we are under Columbia Association. Um, how can the CA board benefit from our advisory committee skills? We feel that, that by having the board members attend our local multicultural events that we plan or that we participate in, because participating will allow CA board members to meet residents of communities that they may not normally interact with who come to our events, and it'll allow them to learn more about the many cultures, customs, and nationalities that are represented here in Colombia. In terms of an important way that CA board members can better serve our committee, it, I feel that it's by reaching out each person to their own Columbia Village and sharing our international multicultural events, as well as any sister cities virtual exchange opportunities for now, with the village boards and the staff. We also hope that you can bring information regarding your village's multicultural and international events to our attention and that you can encourage greater collaboration between the villages and um, the international multicultural programs that Columbia Association offers. So that's it for my report. Um, we look forward to having our board liaison, Jenny Thomas, with us at our next IMAC meeting, which is not scheduled, but, but I think it will be in early August. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, so I have Alan, Tina, Jenny, then Dick. Great, thank you, thank you, Laura. Um, I'm really pleased to hear, every year you've probably heard me say more than once, does the committee have any interest bandwidth in, in reaching out beyond the sort of the cultural awareness part of multicultural and into the more cultural competence and diversity, equity, and inclusion? Uh, and I'm glad to hear of the uh, uh, efforts that have been made over the last year. And I hope they continue, I hope they, my hope is as a board advisory committee, uh, you all can do more of that for us. You know, one of our, one of, you know, Columbia was founded, one of the four pillars of Columbia was racial and, and uh, economic inclusion. One of our, uh, I don't have the exact words, but our strategic plan uh, is, is diversity, equity, inclusion figures prominently. And I'm hoping that you all will take a, uh, a larger role. I mean, but what you, what you all do is wonderful. I mean, so I don't want I don't want to take away anything from the Sister Cities program. I don't want to take anything away from the multicultural cultural awareness programs you all do. And I'm and what I do want is more uh, board advice uh, and com uh, conversation around uh, the larger issues of uh, cultural competence and diversity, equity, and inclusion in Columbia, if your committee decides that that's not something it can do, and again, I'll just speak for myself, I'd like to know that because that may say to me, it might be a good idea to set up another advisory committee that would focus more directly on that. So congratulations on your on your retirement and on your uh, new position. Thank you for coming back and, and continuing to support this important work. And was this Alan? Was this yeah. Alan or Dick? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, I, I'm seeing your f face further down on the screen. Um, yes, actually, um, 
I've been pretty much involved before with, with, with diversity, equity, and inclusion through the school system. One of our activities was also running uh, race dialogues uh, with um, high school students uh, through our Speak Up Howard County youth group. I was recently, because I'm a member of the Baltimore City's uh, Rotterdam Committee, they, Baltimore City, Sister Cities recently had a strategic planning that was all about diversity, equity, inclusion, and how we can become more inclusive, because the key to anybody joining anything is, has to do with um, if you feel included, you know? And so I definitely, we're definitely going to be looking at that and, um, and we'll see how, how that plays out. I mean, we might have our own like strategic planning session on how, how to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we definitely, you know, follow the school systems programs. And I know a lot of different organizations um, have done that. So um, I'm happy to work with whoever on staff or, or other committees um, or people on the board about that. Great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tina? Thank you. I wanted to ask, you had mentioned, Laura, that you wanted to hear about other events. I wanted to know what the mechanism for that is. How do you find out, or how do we let you know? Um, well, I guess you could, um, well, either you can email me directly, or you could um, email Grace Chang, who's on staff. Thank you. Um, or Michelle Miller, because she's Grace, Grace Chang's supervisor, I mean, above Leslie Barnett. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Ginny? Yeah. I want to thank you very much for an excellent report and for all the work that you, you and the committee have been doing. Um, do, are you working uh, or coordinating uh, with the Inner Arbor Trust? Not at the moment, but we de that's another group that we definitely could. I mean, that's Nina Basu, right? Yes, and they put on a lot of uh, cultural uh, activities. It might be neat uh, to coordinate and maybe avoid some duplication or Mm -hmm. have a venue for your group, et cetera. Yes. No, and actually I was just thinking about that because a few days ago I saw something about a Baltimore multicultural festival taking place at Chrysalis, which I thought was odd. And so Grace Chang on staff was just going to look into that. Mm -hmm. Or just a big Korean festival. Oh, that, that would be great. Are you done? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dick? Uh, Laura, it's great to see you again. And I just wanted to say I'm, I'm really happy that you're still on the team and in there. And yes, you do have a great deal of institutional knowledge to share. And yeah. so uh, best wishes on this. Thank you, year. Dick. Thank you. And I'd like to echo that, Laura. Thank you for your service and contribution to the Columbia Association. And I'm very happy to see you continuing on the mm -hmm. um, international multicultural I'm going to call it etc. committee because it sounds like you have a pretty big, um, a pretty big opportunity to expand. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next up we have the middle school and teen advisory committee. We have Renee. Yes, good evening, everyone. I am uh, providing the presentation on behalf of the youth that are members of the middle school and teen advisory committee. So um, their report is as follows. So the, mo the most two impactful accomplishments uh, for Columbia in the last two years are their hosting of their programs, such as the, and this is events that are pre-COVID, such as the middle school takeover, pool parties for middle schoolers and high schoolers, Hear My Voice Teen Day, Columbia Teen Idol, and the Community Chess Day, which is a collaboration with the Howard County Police Department. Their two biggest priorities for the advisory committee for this current year is recruitment, obtaining new members. All but three of the advisory committee members have recently graduated from high school in May. And also they want to reconnect their program efforts with youth and teens in Columbia. They've identified um, um, an area for the CA board to better benefit from the advisory committee skills and expertise, which is engage the committee members in matters that might affect youth and teens in Columbia. And then identify any opportunities for the CA board to better serve the advisory committee. They uh, ask for to have visibly, visibly support 
events hosted by the committee, but also encourage youth in your respective villages to be part of the advisory committee and participate in hosting um, and, and host an event. But in closing, I just want to add that after closing our doors um, on March 16th, due to the pandemic, we have resurged. We opened our doors on June 28th to a summer drop-in recreation program for youth age 9 to 18, Monday through Friday, 4 to 7 p.m. And to date, we do have an average of 10 to 12 youth coming through the doors daily. And that ends our presentation. Thank you so much, and thank you for the services that you provide to the community. Any questions? Renee, do you have your hand up? I, I just have a quick question. Did you meet last year? No, we did not. You mean the committee itself? Right. Oh, they met, they met virtually a couple of times, but it was not the full committee. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tina? When is the committee going to restart meeting? We are hoping to start recruiting uh, this summer into the school year, the early school year. And then once we have a good number uh, of kids, we will poll the time. So we're hoping that September we should start our uh, meeting again. Can you, are there, are, is there a process for students to become involved? You know, there's a, a we have a jot form that they can uh, fill out and just um, express their interest. Thank you. Uh -huh. Could you possibly get a copy of that to each of the board members? Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Thank you Renee. Uh-huh. No, no, you're good. It's a good question. Thank you so much. And good luck on your recruitment for your new committee. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, next up we have the Millennial Advisory Committee. Jason. Hello, everybody. Hello. How are we? Good. Um, so thank you again for, for the time. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to kind of report back to you guys and Jessica. I just first want to just thank Jessica so much and, and the CA staff and the team. It's it's um, I, I think I'm echoing what a lot of people have said, but you guys are amazing and it, it makes it uh, feel that much um, better to, to volunteer and work with you guys. So I just want to give a shout out up front of gratitude. Thank you. Um, so the, the first section of what are the two most impactful accomplishments? So I think the first one, you know, we kind of got caught up into the 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 the, the covid uh kind of crisis we'll call it, in terms of you know how we met what we met about and and what was important before and after that as a group in our mission working with ca um you know i guess what i'll say before that and one of the accomplishments we felt was significant was we found from the data i was lucky enough to be part of the group that put together the uh the exploring ways to serve, better serve millennials i guess before it turned into an advisory committee and um, one of the things that really resonated was people were looking for an opportunity to socialize with other people they didn't know yet. That wasn't strictly kid focused, I guess was kind of, you know, I'm kind of narrating a little bit. So we took that feedback we, and we had a significant survey results that, that kind of showed that need. And we put an idea to the table, which was the, the um, it was the um, party in the park concept that we did at Inter Arbor Trust. And, when you kind of fast forward through that event, it was amazing. You had, you know, you had a, you had a bunch of people out there. You had a mix, some people with kids, some people without kids, and it just felt very, uh, it felt very vibrant, and it felt like Columbia. You know, it was, it was kind of like one of those things where it just felt right. Uh, so we're proud of that. You know, we put that on, and, and one of the things, the feedback we got was having a regularly occurring um, pay, uh, cadence. So you know, first Thursdays or second Wednesdays, something where people knew it was going to be there. So we thought that was a good way to kind of put our foot in the water and show we can put a good event on and people will come out. There's an appetite for that. Um, the second thing that we felt we uh, was most important was work with the communications and marketing department to put to, to kind of help establish better methods for engagement with our demographic. You know, kind of one hand washes the other one. We saw a lot of the survey results come in. It told us that a lot of people in our demographic wanted to be interacted with via Facebook, via email, as opposed to other methods. So we just kind of helped, we thought we helped dial that in a bit. And it, it was it was, it was was significant to kind of, you know, kind of turn that corner with that kind of approach. Um, two biggest priorities for the advisory council, I think, you know, are really what's coming up and it's, it's bursting at the seams. I'm sure a lot of people are hearing this is that, you know, helping to understand and helping shape the conversation around affordable housing. You know, that is by far and away one of the biggest challenges and obstacles we're seeing from our demographic of, of calling Columbia home. If, if 
people are not living with their parents. Um, so that, that's a big one. Uh, and the next priority is, as I said before, is helping to establish a cadence of regularly occurring fun events that include food, you know, music, et cetera, to, to kind of help people mingle. You know, a lot of people, and I grew up here in Columbia, went to Oakland Mills. One of my blind spots, which I appreciate learning through this process, was that, you know, a lot of people moved here for work and they don't really know anybody else. And I kind of thought the opposite. I was like, wow, Columbia is just such a connected community. Uh, so that, that it showed that that was a big need and, and that was one of our priorities. Uh, let's see. Uh, opportunities for the better benefit opportunities for the CA board to better benefit from our advisory um, group. I think what, what what the group came up with was, I think just more visibility into some of the decisions that you guys are making that are like, we'll call them policy decisions, because I think unless we're attending these board meetings, it just didn't feel like we had a really good pulse of what are the issues of the day? What are you guys focused on? And maybe we could kind of proactively contribute ideas or resources towards challenges that the CA board is facing. Uh, the second one was honestly, we're kind of digging here because you know we think we think we're doing a great job. We, we really like the relationship, but just again, reestablishing better and more uh, regular communication. Um, so, kind of better awareness of what you, you know, the board is focused on, and then more active communication, maybe to discuss those items. Um, the next section we have here: identify opportunities for to better serve us. Um, again, you know, we, we're really. Um, grateful for all the effort and energy when we kind of had to think about it. I think one was, again, the, the more regular communication stuck out again, but also I think for us to better understand kind of CA's philosophy and position in, in two major categories, one being climate change and the other being transit and mobility. Um, so I think we really felt like having a better understanding of what CA's philosophy is, the goals are, actions being planned to be taken in those categories were, were meaningful for our group. So that's... That's what we got. Awesome, Jason, thank you. Any questions for Jason? All right, well, I appreciate the actionable uh, suggestions, and thank you to everyone who serves on the committee. Okay, next up, we have the Senior Advisory Committee. Sharon Lee? She's muted. Uh, Sharon, you're... Sharon Lee, you're muted. Is there a red button at the bottom of your screen? I think I found oh, it. Oh, you found it, excellent. <laughs> Okay, I'm used to looking in the top right corner. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, the two most important or impactful accomplishments of the committee in the last year, or actually two, because last year is pandemic, was we continued to meet through the pandemic. Uh, we wrote articles for senior columns in village newsletters such as for Wild Lake and Long Reach, and supported the age-friendly community initiative of the county. Uh, we provided feedback to CA on implementation of various items in of the May 2014 Older Adult Community Plan, and we supported the expansion and, bil and building the new site for the East Columbia 50 Plus Center which will benefit people actually all over Columbia. The biggest priorities for the SAC this year uh, was have CA facilities, uh, I mean, for this year, to have CA facilities make information available on health and wellness and mental health for seniors and how seniors uh, can be made more aware of the resources of CA in essence, making CA a source for information for this constituency. Uh, one of the things that we are doing right now is helping to kick off and advocate and support for Walk for Health in Columbia in conjunction with the Office on Aging and Independence and with the state of Maryland. 
uh, in October, but they haven't determined which day in October, it will be a Maryland-wide Walk for Health Day. And we would like to see that expanded and have CA do that year round here in Columbia, because walking is something everybody can do easily. Uh, we will continue our advocacy and, and support for expanded senior hours and pricing for pickball. Uh, we were the uh, first ones to start advocating with CA to include pickleball courts and lessons for seniors here in Columbia. And we're happy that it is moving along, but we want it to be better. We will continue to monitor and seek information on the status of items in the strategic plan and the Older Americans Plan of 2014 by inviting appropriate county personnel to make presentations so that the Senior Advisory Committee can make recommendations for modifications uh, and participation. Uh, we also continue to advocate for renewal for grants to senior service organizations, such as the Village and Howard. 70% of the, 77% of the members of the Village and Howard live in Columbia. We would also like to see more support for Neighbor Ride, which helps a great deal in keeping seniors who no longer drive active and able to get out within the community and go to doctor's offices, go to the uh, CA facilities. Uh, identifying opportunities for the CA board to better benefit from our committee's skills and expertise uh, we would like uh, to see the Senior Advisory Committee included in a face-to-face -face meeting with the board on senior issues very specifically in Columbia, such as in discussions, programs impacting seniors such as dues, fees, service hours before final decisions are made and not just tell us what you're doing and that's a, a you know, the decisions already made. Uh, we would like the CA board to invite or include one or two members of the Senior Advisory Committee to be non-voting members on the CA board to make sure that the voice of seniors uh, is heard. Uh, number four, identify opportunities for the CA board to better serve the Senior Advisory Committee. Uh, board members were requesting to encourage their individual communities and villages uh, for representation on our committee on there are villages that just don't have anybody on our committee and we have worked and worked to get somebody and we still don't have them from River Hill uh, Town Center. Now we have people who live in Town Center but they are all living at the residences at Vantage Point and they're at large members. We would like to have a member officially appointed by the town center board on our committee. Uh, we need a new representative from Hickory Ridge because the old representative who's now a member at large has moved to my village, Longreach. Uh, we don't have anyone from Hickory Ridge, Harper's Choice, or Oakland Mills on the committee. Uh, and we would like the CA board to encourage seniors to be involved in all the CA committees and advisory groups set so that those voices are heard in every area that CA is involved in. And that's the report. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? Uh, Ginny? Yeah, thanks. Um, two, two questions. On the pickleball courts, are you also lobbying the county uh, to make sure they do their fair share? Uh, we are advisory to CA. Okay, Individual so. members of our committee do lobby personally 
to the county, yeah. but it wouldn't be appropriate for us to go and say, we're representing CA, please do this. <laughs> okay, good point. Um, CA did take a leadership role about two years ago in getting all the groups together to try and work so that we would avoid duplication and work on that issue, and I think they made some progress. Yes, um, they did. Yeah, which was good, and CA uh, had a lot of staff on that. Um, the other thing that I'm confused about is, number one, uh, transportation continue the senior event shuttle and work with Howard it's County. Been well, anyway, stopped. pardon me? Uh, the, se the senior events shuttle has been discontinued now. Right, that's what I was confused about because uh, it was 54,000, I think, and it was cut. Um, but there's, uh, there was a list given to the county to, and asked that they perhaps could fund that. Um, so you may want to also lobby the county, see if they're willing to fund it um, as well. The county says they but have no money. <laughs> okay. Um, I know everything we're all paying in, we kind of question that. But. But, okay, I was just thinking of all the um, money that they're getting, maybe they could use some for the senior shuttle. Um, okay, the, the, but I did look on the website, and our website, and I thought it did say something about it still in existence, and I meant to check that out. No. So that, that's why I thought maybe you knew something new, but I'll double no. check that again on our website. Okay, thanks yeah. for all you do, and I'm sorry okay. I thought Paul Virchinsky did was on there representing Oakland Mills, but mm -hmm. I guess something happened, so uh, thank you. He had other priorities, he said. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sharon Lee. And I recommend that you reach out to each board member of the villages where you need representation um, to solicit their help in. We've done that, and so has Michelle. Okay. <laughs> it was worth a suggestion. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay. We'll continue to ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good night, all. Good night. Thank you. All right. So next up, we have Tennis Advisory Committee. Leo? Uh, Leo, you're muted. Uh, so it should be a red button at the bottom left of the... How about now? Yep, that's great. Thank you. Oh, had to go to the upper right, believe it or not. Oh, sorry about that. You must be on an iPad. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm on an Android. Ah, that's why. See, I'm. that's a foreign object to me. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, well, first of all, I've interfaced with most of the folks here in the committee with two exceptions. Uh, one is our new president, uh, Lakey Boy. How do you do? Nice to meet and, you. <laughs> and I suspect there's an interesting family story that gives rise to your first name. Is that and true? You perhaps could be correct, sir. <laughs> but you're not going to share tonight, are not you? Not in a public forum. No. <laughs> okay. Another time. <laughs> okay. And secondly, uh, I see that Tina Horn is the new Nancy McCord. Welcome aboard. <laughs> We're not quite that way, but okay. <laughs> uh, a suggestion I would have, uh, Nancy did something called Nancy's Notes. Oh, yeah. After each board meeting, she would post her comments on the Wild Lake um, website. And I would encourage you to, to uh, do the same. I, I thought it was pretty informative. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's your call. Nonetheless, this is the tennis committee. It's been a most interesting year. We all know that. Um, I, for one, played very little tennis. I stayed completely out of the loop until I was vaccinated. Uh, tennis went on. The committee was most helpful in uh, getting Hobbits Glen up to speed and used last summer in 2020, for which we thank you. Uh, Hobbits Glen... <clears throat> Hobbits Glen has also uh, um, had its $300,000 upgrade, which is completed. The hard true courts are now state-of-the-art. 
there's just there's nothing else you really need there except to maintain them to take care of them make sure they stay that way between hobbits glen <clears throat> and the facility at long reach they're going to outlive me which is perfectly <laughs> fine um tennis community um is moving right along i understand that in the month of june the participation rate was 90 percent of our rate in 2019. that's pretty close to being back to where you want to be mm -hmm. uh, also usta leagues which go on year round are projecting to finish up at around 3,900, 4,000 participants, which is also in line with previous years other than 2020. Um, so we're all there. there there's, there's nothing else to say. We, we are a recreational activity. We understand that. We appreciate the facilities you've given us. We want to take care of them. Uh, uh, keep them usable where everybody in the community can partake and enjoy. That's pretty much all there is to say about what's going on in tennis world. We, we, in a manner of speaking, we lack for nothing. Are there any questions? Oh, uh, we have Renee and then Dick. Yeah, so Leo, I do have a question. Um, the Hartrue courts, have you been up there since they've been renovated this year and you've been vaccinated? Yes, correct. Uh, have you seen the, um, has CA purchased the additional hard true product to keep those courts up? That depends. What product are you referencing? There's a product that you are supposed to buy to keep the courts. Um, I, I'm not a tennis player. That okay. you, you put down. To well, let, me say, let me say this. The courts, the courts are every spring need to be freshened up right. and our true material added and the courts need to be checked for um, pitch and alignment and and the the uh, the tape put down it's mm -hmm. something like that all of that was done in the spring that'll need to be done next spring okay. and the spring after that and so forth and so on there's there's no other material uh, which I'm familiar that you need to deal with other than uh, sweeping the courts, rolling it periodically. Right. And as we learned earlier in the spring, you need to go around and pull the weeds and uh, keep the debris down. Right. Um, also uh, sweep the walking paths adjacent to the courts uh, because hard true material does because it's on shoes and everything like that does get outside the courts and also the 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 concrete pad in front of the the um the check-in stand it gets debris on it so that needs to be swept and or blown but as far as any other material no. that you need uh to maintain you know during season no, nothing comes to mind that, that I can tell you about. No, it was the hard true product itself that CA seemed to not always have on hand. That's Renee, yes. Renee, this is Anish. I'm, uh, I'm, I can help uh, answer that question a little bit just to help piggyback on what Leo was saying. Yes, we did order extensive amount of hard true this year. Thank you. And after every adverse rainstorm we have or anything that inclement weather brings apart, whether it's a you know, gusty winds or whatever, our team will look at the surface and see if that the hard true has kind of blown away or been washed away with the inclement weather. Then our team goes and puts extra hard true in all those areas and then brushes it and rolls it again. Thank you, that was the question. Thank you. Uh, Dick? Uh, yes, uh, you're uh, called the uh, Tennis Advisory Committee. I take it you represent all the racquetball sports, all of the uh, racket sports? Dick, Dick, that's the rumor. <laughs> what, can I, what can I answer for you? Mm -hmm. Was that the question? That was it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yes, apparently we do represent the racquetball sports, but we don't represent racquetball. I, I meant curious, to say racket sports, you know. But, but uh, you know, that's that's but, in the fitness facility, whereas the the pickleball, as you well know, uh, Owen Brown has got. Um, 
two former tennis courts, which were converted to six uh, pickleball courts. So, yes, I would say that falls under this committee. Mm -hmm. uh, the other racquetball facilities around town are the uh, are, are laid out on open space tennis courts. So they really don't come under our jurisdiction, as it were. And, and certainly any um, any racquetball courts that are laid out for pickleball are also not something that we get connected with. Pickleball right now is uh, is everybody's kind of poor orphan in the whole world of things. That said, I will tell you that the pickleball representative on the um, tennis committee, uh, Dwayne St. Clair, is now a CA staff person. Hmm. And Anish can correct me what goes on here, but I believe Dwayne is charged with organizing and running CA's uh, um, appropriate pickleball activities. Is that correct, Anish? Yes, we brought Dwayne. We were very happy to bring Dwayne on board about two months ago, uh, right towards the end of the fiscal year in April. And then we kind of got together and started launching a lot of different you know, diverse pickleball programs, starting from instructional clinics to private and semi-private lessons. And as of three weeks ago, we even launched Open Play and are right now in the works of putting together a league for pickleball come fall. So there's a lot of traction we're building around putting things out there for pickleball for the community. Well, that's also, good, Dick, good to hear. I would Dwayne is quite, you, quite an impressive guy. Uh, Dick, I would also tell you that uh, Dwayne uh, tells me that they are going to recruit another person out of the pickleball community to uh, sit on the uh, on the tennis committee. Oh, good. Or racket committee, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Leo. You're welcome. And thank you for always advocating for tennis. <laughs> um, it's what I do. <laughs> awesome. All right, next up we have, last but not least, the Watershed Advisory Committee. Deborah? Uh, do you know, we have seen, Deborah Westmore on? Bouncing and out, is she here? Do you see her, John? I don't. Yeah. Hi, this is Deborah. Can oh, you hear hi, me? Oh, hi, Deborah. Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi, I um, am coming to you from vacation, so unfortunately I do not have good connectivity out here. And I will ask if this phone call drops, if Mr. McCoy would pick up where I leave off. Uh, the Watershed Advisory Committee did meet this last year during the pandemic uh, with much appreciation to John McCoy because he spent time arranging and he attended the meetings despite the fact he was on furlough. Uh, the committee currently has members from each village plus an at-large member with the exception of Harper's Choice. And we would appreciate the board's assistance to try to find a candidate. We've had, I believe, three candidates uh, come to us from Harper's Choice and unfortunately leave because they moved into other villages. So it'd be nice if we could get someone who's from Harper's Choice and who understands uh, what that community has endured and benefited from, especially the work with Ecotone and the State Highway Administration to renovate the stream beds there. As far as our key accomplishments, um, we have coordinated our efforts with the Climate Change and Sustainability Advisory Committee to highlight watershed-related risks and priorities. And um, we are focusing instead uh, during the pandemic timeframe on village level projects that include tree plantings and pull and plant activities where we could have our volunteers from the communities come out, work with us to put new trees in, put new native plants in to replace some uh, invasives that were along open space territory and get that work done while being appropriately distanced so that we didn't spread COVID around the neighborhood. Our current priorities, uh, we would like to have a field trip and invite the CA board members to attend to see some of the watershed projects. Right now, John is planning a trip for early September 
that will look at what has been done up in the Harper's Choice area uh, by the State Highway Administration because they got the easement from CA to work on that property. Uh, you've probably seen some news stories, et cetera, and I know Lakey has taken a trip with John out to the location and heard from some of the residents about some of their concerns. It is changing the way that big projects will be approached in the future in terms of having a little bit more control on the types of trees that will be um, removed during a project and access to various locations. And Harper's Choice is fortunately or unfortunately one of the next major projects that has to be worked on, but CA is going to need some easements from the school system in order to get that work done. Uh, we want to identify water-related vulnerability challenges uh, having to do with what the Climate Change and Sustainability Committee is doing. Our folks on the committee, as well as anyone they could touch, have filled out the survey that was put out by the Sustainability Committee. But we've also suggested that the Sustainability Committee take a look at the Versar report, which was done back in the 2008-2009 timeframe. Uh, and it was using CA funds to take a look at what a Columbia-wide watershed management plan should be. Now, fortunately, um, we have been able to attack through staff many of those projects, but not all of them. There were a lot of projects. So we'd like to have the climate change and sustainability take a look at what areas have been addressed and what areas might have continuing needs, particularly with respect to erosion. Uh, we are going to be working with the village uh, committees that have to do with RAC in order to update the guidelines in each of the villages so that they adhere to the new state law. Uh, Delegates Feldmark and Hill from Howard County sponsored a bill that is asking HOAs to allow residents to put in watershed mitigation practices in their landscape. Um, some HOAs have prohibited people from having anything but grass. Uh, we are hoping that's going to change now that the law is in place. Uh, as far as board interaction, we want to thank seriously Sherry Zaret for attending as many meetings as she possibly can. She has been there and she has been a voice for the board as well as a voice for herself and for other people in the environmental community, letting us know about other programs that were going on and encouraging our members to be part of those activities. We do suggest continued and increased visual communication to the CA board. Open Space is starting to present you with uh, visuals that show you the before situations and some of the after situations where watershed work has been done. We think that it's important if you don't have a chance to go visit these areas that you at least see a pictorial so that you can understand how the work is being conducted and what the work has resulted in. We believe that many of the projects worked on by staff and by their contractors have done a great job to help mitigate some of the water issues that we've had here inside of Columbia. To alleviate budget impacts, we would love to hear from the board on areas where funding might be done under grants that somehow CA could manage. John did a fantastic job of getting grants for rain gardens early on and I know he installed over 400 rain gardens with those grants. But are there other areas that the board feels that we could get grant money to assist with projects and alleviate some of the pressure on CA's direct budget so that we don't end up having to have higher assessments for our residents? Also, are there any areas where the board has identified any inequity in diversity and inclusion where watershed remediation needs to be done more in some areas than in others. We're not saying that we have all the answers, but perhaps the board does. We thank you for the opportunity to serve Columbia. Our members are very stalwart in doing their environmental best, and we hope that we can continue to do that for Columbia and CA in particular. 
Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Jenny, question? Yeah. Uh, regarding the rain gardens, are there any issues that your committee is concerned about there? You know, X number have been uh, installed, but are they being maintained? Mm. Um, that is always a problem, Jenny, and unless we're invited back out by the residents, either directly as the watershed committee or uh, many of us are watershed stewards that serve on the committee, so many of us go out to revisit homes that are having problems. And I will tell you that in my own explorations, I have seen about a 50-50 um, investment in the rain gardens. Some people just don't know how to maintain them, and we need to get better about putting out other information. Last year, CA, through the staff, presented um, something on how to do rain garden maintenance. We have developed a rain garden maintenance document that can be shared with people through the villages. Um, but many people just don't have the wherewithal to maintain them. They don't have the knowledge of the plants or they don't have the specifics that um, they would need to do that. A lot of times it's just mulch, but many times it's weeding and that's a tough thing. Uh, Tina, is there a map of the rain gardens that have been installed? Uh, John has a map of all of the rain gardens, plus there is a tool that the University of Maryland has it's called a smart tool that we try to record all of the rain gardens on so that the county can get uh, credit for TMDLs for any type of mitigation practices that have been put into place. Is that through the National Center for Smart Growth? No, it's not. It's through the University of Maryland Extension. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the Watershed Committee? Mm -mm. All right, thank you, Deborah, and thank you to everyone that participates in the Watershed Committee. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our agenda tonight. I'd like to thank all of the advisory committees for submitting their written reports and for presenting um, the questions that were requested at this meeting. I think it was very enlightening. Um, and I look forward to enhanced and robust exchanges with all of the advisory committees, so thank you. Question? Yes, question. Is it possible to get a list of the committee members from my village or for each of us? Because I would love to build those relationships. Like, I see some of the folks listed, you know, this person is from Wildlife, that person is from Owen Brown. Is it possible to get that information across many of the committees? We can investigate. I can look into that, but I'll tell you, I requested a list of everyone and we don't have consistent information on which village they're from. We have a list of all the participants, mm -hmm. um, but not all of the committees collect that Thank you. information. Okay. Okay, can I have a motion to adjourn? So oh, moved. So moved. Okay. <laughs> There's three of them, so one's a first and one's a second. Okay. <laughs> Any objection? All right, so meeting is adjourned at 8.52 p.m. Thank you, everyone.